and the political affiliation between the ANC, the SATU, and the South African Communist Party. It is especially relevant in the year the ANC celebrates its 100 year anniversary amidst ongoing debates about the state of our new democracy and the future of the party. Webster has gone from being arrested in 1975 for, quote, prompting worker unrest, to being recognized with the prestigious Aya Bahat Visiting Professorship for Development and Decent Work at Castle University in 2009. He has worked at different levels of the labor movement and has made invaluable contributions to this movement throughout his career. From the, from the new beginnings of the labor movement in 1973 to the founding of Kosatu, Kosatu, Natu, Fedusa, his, life, his life's work is also a history of the working class movement in our country. In his 33 years at the University of the Witwatersrand, Professor Webster served as the head of the sociology department and dedicated his work to researching and finding answers to, to quote, sorry, he has dedicated his life's work to, quote, researching and finding answers to national and international labor questions, end quote. Webster has been credited with transforming the study of labor internationally and growing it growing the field as an inter, in, in, important area in the academy. Webster's research has focused on theories of democratic transition, changing workplace presentation, representation, and its relationship to economic performance, and the changing role of labor during the consolidation of democracy in South Africa. He was the founder and director of Society Work and Development Institute, and has authored or co-authored six books, 32 chapters in books, 34 refereed articles, 32 research reports, 35 book reviews, and 29 published articles in popular media, media and counting. We are honored to host him. The format of this evening is uh, Professor Webster will talk for about 35 minutes, then we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, for time, we ask that everyone limits to one or two questions, and if we have more time, we'll come around for more questions. Thank you. Okay, well, um, Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. And thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to um, share ideas with you uh, this evening. And I wanted first to ask you a question. Um, if you lose your way in the forest, or in the mountains. What do you have to do? Hmm? Comrade, I didn't hear you. Hmm? What would you do? If you lose your way? Huh? Yes, what do you do if you lose your way? What do you have to do? But you've lost your way. I was taught that if you lose your way, you've got to retrace your steps. Right? You've got to go back to where you started, from what you remember. And that's what I want to do with you this evening. I want to take you back to where a movement started. And I want to take you back because I think we've lost our way. And when you lose your way, you've got to go back and look at where you've come from. And I want to, in taking you back in time, I want to look at it from another place. I want to look at it, I want to start in Durban in the 1970s, the height of apartheid. The English historian E.H. Uh, e. Carr used to say, what you see depends on which side of the mountain you stand. So I want to stand, I want you to stand and look at the rise of the workers' movement 
in Durban in the 1970s. And I want to begin with a survey I did, a questionnaire. And I asked workers, black workers, in 1975, who do you think is a leader in the present or the past of African workers? Okay? Now, who do you think they said? 1973, 1975. Hmm? Moses Mabida. Moses Mabida, okay. That's interesting. Of course, there now is a stadium named after him. Who else? A leader, past or present, of African workers. <clears throat> I think, I think uh, you, you're, 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 you're stealing a bit of my thunder here. Butelezi, okay. Okay, gotcha, Butelezi. I mean, who's, who's the sort of most popular figure in South Africa, politically? Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Okay. Oh, is it obvious? Mandela, okay. Past or present? Huh? No, he didn't come up. Interesting. Tamba, no, he didn't come up. No, Sonny Sachs didn't come up. A leader, past or present? Latuli. Albert Latuli. Albert Latuli. This is how, and this is the order that it came in. Albert Latuli was overwhelmingly the highest. Then came Gacha Butileze. And then came Mandela. And then Moses Mabida. And when I, I presented these results to my colleagues, fellow white intellectuals like me, one of them, who subsequently became a minister, Alec Irwin, do you know the name? He said to me, who is Moses Mabida? Okay, now this is 40 years ago. I said, I don't know. I don't know who Moses Mabida is. What I do know is that this man who did the survey, he would have been objective. And if this is what the workers said, I believe him. Of course, and this was, this was the lesson for me, that these workers were struggling, they weren't just blank checks. They had, they had a history of their own. They had struggles of their own. They had their own political traditions. They weren't just a black, blank check, and they were deeply rooted in Durban at the time, early 1970s. Now, I want to put a, a, a question to you uh, in this lecture, which I, I want to try and answer. What happened in 1973? There were strikes, mass strikes for the first time after a period when the ANC had been banned and the other political movements. And these strikes led to the emergence of black trade unions. Trade unions for black workers re-emerged at the height of, of apartheid. But they also, at the same time, there was, there is, of course, a, a history of trade unionism that goes back to after the First World War in South Africa for, for black workers. And there was a tradition, and the tradition was linked to the African National Congress, 
what was called the South African Congress of Trade Unions, SACTU. So you had, if you like, a history of struggle through the ANC and through SACTU that goes back many decades. And then you have a new movement that emerged, a new movement that uh, was uh, uh, had a different kind of organization that emerged in the, the wake of the strikes of 1973. And the question I'm posing to you, and I want you to uh, think it through with me, is, is, is there one continuous tradition in South Africa, what I've called a seamless web? Or did we see emerging in the 1970s a new kind of labor movement, a new kind of labor movement? And that's the question I'm, I'm posing here. I've called it seamless web or democratic rupture. Is there something fundamentally new that emerged? And what I want to, to, uh, to begin with is to take two uh, different perspectives. And I want to draw from, I don't know whether, uh, Zaki, you have the, um, so the uh, South African Democratic Trust, Road to Democracy in South Africa. You don't have it here. There are two interpretations. There's the one interpretation that says that this movement grew from the exile, from the ANC, uh, and then there's an alternative interpretation by David Hempson and Martin Legasic and others that argues that these unions emerged because of a focus on the day-to-day -day problems that workers faced. So you've got these two, let's say, narratives about, about the relationship between trade unions and the ANC. And I want to uh, present to you three propositions about three arguments about, about uh, this. And I'd like to, to begin by, by uh, showing how, how these, these movements first emerged. I think there were two things that happened that allowed these organizations to emerge. The first one is that you had a group of, let's call them intellectuals. Now, when you think of intellectuals, what do you think of? How, what do you think an intellectual is? How would you define an intellectual? What do you understand by that word, intellectual? Intellectual. Who's an intellectual? Hmm? Right. Me, an intellectual. Why? Why am I intellectual? So, for your idea of an intellectual, is somebody who has been to university and has ideas and is that what you think? No. Not. Uh, what uh, is there? How would you define that? Per what is there a particular term you would use for that? What kind of intellectual is that? Hmm? Organic. Organic. That's it. I think we should give it a big hand. Yeah, that's a wonderful. <laughs> okay. 
I, if I could, I think the organic intellectual, I need to, uh, there are different kinds of intellectuals. I think an organic intellectual, you are organic intellectuals. And the person who developed this idea, does anyone know who, who first used that term? Hmm? These guys are the cheating in the front row. Yeah, Gramsci. Yeah. There's a, the, the organic. You, you should note this here because it describes so many organic intellectuals. And by organic intellectuals, he meant people who are in the working class who didn't necessarily study at university but had ideas. And he says anyone, he says we are all intellectuals. That's what makes us human. That's what distinguishes us from a horse or a cow. We can think. So we're all intellectuals. Antonia Gramsci said we're all intellectuals. Uh, and these are intellectuals of the working class. There are different kinds of, 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 of intellectuals. Uh, and these intellectuals, uh, I, I would suggest, were, were crucial in developing the workers' movement. But they're not the organic intellectuals. And then you have the, the, the term I would use would, would be freelance. I, I'd classify myself exactly as a freelance intellectual. I'm not working for anyone in particular, right? That's a sort of free-floating intellectual. And then you may have a more sort of professional type of intellectual. And that would be uh, the lawyers, that you need the lawyers uh, uh, in, the, in the labor movement or economists. So you had coming together, you had coming together in Durban in the 1970s, intellectuals, uh, organic intellectuals, workers who, who, who uh, began to think of how one could actually organize workers. You had uh, lawyers who came to work with the, the labor movement. You had what I would call party intellectuals. Party intellectuals, in other words, intellectuals that, that are in the party. Now, there was one who worked with us who subsequently became very famous. And I'll give you the clue. I'll give you the clue. He has many wives. <laughs> Jacob Zuma, yeah, you got it. Jacob Zuma, you've got it now. He's, he doesn't, it's not the only thing he's done in life. He has also done other things. He, he came off Robben Island in 1972, right? And uh, at the time, the ANC was banned, the Communist Party was banned, but he was also part of it. But he's a different kind of intellectual in the sense that he was an intellectual of the... Peasantry. Uh, of the peasantry. Well, of, of the party, really. I'm calling it party intellectuals. And what you have... So, I think the first thing that brought this movement together was uh, the idea of uh, intellectuals bringing ideas of that workers could begin to understand their experiences and why it was necessary for them to come together collectively. Because the idea of the trade union is an injury to one is a and all. It's collective. You stand together. You stand together. If you stand together, then you have collective strength and you're much stronger than when you're on your own. And what had happened in Durban is workers had simply, all they'd done is stopped work, folded their arms, and said, high corner, no more work, right? And if you do that, if you hold back your labor, you go out on strike, that's your weapon. It's not a gun, it's actually a peaceful weapon. You stop work, you do it in a disciplined way. That's important because you've got to stand together. And you've got to have solidarity, collective solidarity. So the idea was if workers came together 
and they acted and they built organizations, they could actually challenge the apartheid system from within, inside the factories, in the workplace. But in order to, to understand that, intellectuals brought, brought uh, ideas about how the economy works, about how society works, how the laws work. So when we started off then, it was quite, uh, quite simple really. You had factory workers who'd never used a telephone. So we'd have little exercises in the office to explain how and play out the role. You the, you the union organizer, you're trying to get the union recognized and you've got to speak to the boss. What do you say to the boss? Okay, so you're building up organization. And there are three principles that were central to that organization. And I'm going to come back to because they're quite fundamental. The first principle and, 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 uh, 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 is that you elect your representatives and those representatives have a mandate. Okay? They're not just there to do what they want to do. They are there with a man mandate to carry out what the wishes of the workers are. Okay? So that's the first idea. And the second one is that they are accountable. That is that they are elected by the workers and they are responsible uh, to those, those workers. And then the third idea was workers' control. That the workers would actually control those, those unions. So you'd build up your strength at the base. At the base. This is the, the sort of central idea that intellectuals pushed forward that there's a need to build up strong cadre of leaders who would win. It wouldn't be like smash the state and overthrow the state. No, no. It was much more uh, the word incremental, it, it, step by step, all right? Step by step. So if a worker is dismissed because he came late for work and the white supervisor says, you're out, okay? You don't, as an individual, try and tack that supervisor. What you do is you get together with your fellow workers and you stop work and you make a demand and you say, we're not going to work until you reinstate that man. So what you're doing then is you're building up democracy from below, making your leaders accountable to the members, but you're demonstrating to them that they have power. That's what you're doing. You're putting power in their hands. But it's power that's being used in a very disciplined way because your strength lies in your collective solidarity. But what you're demonstrating to the workers that if you, if you uh, take an issue up that is directly related to the workers' experience, like a dismissal, like a racial abuse, or a wage demand, then you're going to build up step by step a movement. And that's that's really how the organization began to emerge uh, in, in Durban. But it's not just intellectuals. You can't do this simply through activism. The reason why workers responded to these demands was because the intellectuals were stepping, 
and activists were tapping into their lived experiences, their own experiences. It wasn't something from outside, it was something that was part of the experiences. And if you can go back and think about the 1970s and what was happening and the experiences, one of the first things that struck me, every meeting would open with a prayer. Now let's see, this is something unusual. But of course, what they said in the prayer was uh, lungu and so on and so forth, you know, saying all sorts of things. Uh, 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 but uh, 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 basically, uh, the point is that to get through to those workers, you had to speak their language and their experience. And at the time, of course, you also had the black consciousness movement. Living in Durban at the time was Steve Biko. And Steve Biko had said, look, black people must come together, common experiences. And he emphasized the importance of black people having a sense of their own dignity. Black is beautiful. Black is, uh, has, has its own history, building up the confidence. So there, there were other uh, experiences. There were the struggles in the schools at the time by students against Bantu education. And there's also things in African society that the unions drew on, like Stockfells, where they would actually come together and share their rotating credit. And also a tradition that when you make decisions, you make decisions that everyone is included in it. So you have, you have this tradition uh, of, of building up a, a grassroots movement. But of course, that's only half of the story. At the same time, you had that other tradition, the ANC tradition. And the ANC tradition, of course, at the time was in exile and uh, was following a different strategy. It was following a strategy of armed struggle, of Mkuntu Wesizwe. Now, that was a difficult, difficult situation. And there was quite a lot of tension. Don't forget now, Jacob Zuma is underground reporting to the ANC. The trade unions are above ground and are trying to negotiate in the factories. So their strategy at the time was to try and recruit activists into Mkuntu Wesizwe. And in fact, um, the one who was, who, who, who was most effective was Harry Gwala, who became uh, a, a leading a leading figure. So there was a, you had, on the one hand, you had a movement that was emphasizing participatory democracy, accountability on the shop floor, recall of your leaders, and then you had a, a political movement that was designed to build, to smash the apartheid state. So there was th those two, and uh, the trade unions, as they grew in the 70s, they survived. The law was changed to recognize black unions. They became more and more powerful, and they became a central force, and Kasatu, the Congress of African Trade Unions, was formed in, in 1985, grew out of that, that tradition. But it was a compromise, because the first thing that Kasatu did when it was formed in Durban in 1985 was to go, the leadership, the Secretary General, 
of Kasatu was? Jainaidu. Jainaidu, the first thing they do is went to Lusaka and they spoke to the ANC and that was the basis of the alliance between ANC uh, and, and Kasatu, but it was never a comfortable alliance. It was never a comfortable alliance because the trade unions had developed their own leaders. They developed their own political culture. And most importantly, they developed their own finances. Because when you get recognition in the shop floor from management, the first thing you do is an agreement whereby the company takes off a certain amount of money every month off your salary before being a member. So the union had money of its own. And when the ANC came back to South Africa in 1919, it was banned from exile, Kasatu was a very powerful force, an independent force. And that, I think, has opened up a sort of tension between the ANC and the trade union movement. And it's something I think we see today ongoing tension between the Kasatu that is responding to workers' interests that are to do with day-to-day -day issues, wages, working conditions, maybe talking socialism as a long-term goal, and the ANC governing the country in a globalized world where the pressure is on governments to encourage investment by foreign companies. I always recall when Nelson Mandela came out of prison in, <coughs> was it February 1990, and spoke here in Caledon Square and said the ANC is, is committed to nationalization. That's the Freedom Charter. I think it was two years later after he'd been to the, the World Economic Forum and he dropped the N-word and he replaced it with the P-word. What's the P-word? Privatization. And that, I think, is, is, is the, the, the pressures. And that sort of opened up the tension. But it's, it's a tension where there hasn't been a divorce, where there's tension between the ANC uh, and uh, Kasatu, because Kasatu is an independent organization with its own program. And next Friday, we'll see that acted out again in the strike in, in uh, Gauteng, where Kasatu's challenging the ETOL and uh, the government is trying to maintain its, uh, its uh, new, uh, its new uh, uh, public transport system and get the money back. So just if, if I could then just, if, just to um, conclude what, I, what I, I think, what I'm suggesting to you is that uh, there was a moment in the 1970s when uh, an alternative tradition was emerging in Durban. It was a new generation of young activists like you committed to building up a democratic movement from below, emphasizing participation, accountability, mandating. But that sort of embryo, if you know that word embryo, the beginning of something, embryo, what's another word for an embryo? A, a seed, that sort of seed 
of a movement that was democratic, shop floor based, it was overtaken by broader political and national events. And although that tradition continues in the labor movement, it, it didn't break through and achieve that idea of a participatory uh, democracy. And at the, at the center of that idea was, and I, I want to end on this, but I, I want to write it down. Uh, there was an argument that you need to think of utopia. Now, what does utopia mean? What does it mean? Utopia. Uh, huh? Utopia is a beautiful place with peace, with nothing. It's where everyone gets everything that you want, which means which are, it's a lovely place where there is no destruction. It's interesting. I mean, you're, you're, you're right at one level. I have to use this, do I? It's like many words in English. Yeah. It's, it comes from the Greek word. And topia is place. And you is nowhere. It's no place. That's what it means. Utopia is something in your head. It's this vision of an alternative society where there'd be equality, where there would be harmony, redistribution, democracy. But the, the argument is that if you want to build something different, okay, you have to think in utopian terms. You've got to think of an alternative that doesn't exist. That's, and the person who, who developed those ideas, and I want to end with that, was a fellow uh, intellectual called Rich, Richard Turner who wrote this book called The Eye of the Needle. Now, you know that biblical phrase, The Eye of the Needle? The Eye of the Needle? I mean, you guys are sort of well trained in biblical. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than for a wealthy man to enter the kingdom of God. You got it. It's easy, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. So what Turner was arguing for that in, 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 in 1972 was the idea that we could actually build a utopia. And he, he's, his first chapter was called The Necessity of Utopian Thinking. The Necessity of Utopian Thinking. And I want to leave you with that, um, with that, that idea that if you want to change the world, You actually have to think first of how it could be different. You've got to think of what a different world would look like. And once you've got that vision of a different world, then you mobilize people around that. But the point I would want to emphasize is that these, this early workers' movement, and I would, I would say that that tradition of shop floor demo democratic unionism continues inside Kasatu, but it may not be the dominant form in Kasatu, because I think things have happened, new men of power, people get wealthy, they start taking on tenders, and so on and so forth. But there is a tradition there, the tradition that I'm wanting to share with you this evening is that tradition of building democracy from below at the grassroots. But it's something that 
takes a long period of time. It's a step-by-step -step one. And the key point about it is, I think, is that you have to build up support by showing that you can win gains. Incremental, step-by-step. -step. And in that way, you build up an organization. And that started very, very um, modestly. And I must say, Richard Turner was assassinated on the 8th of January, 1978. Uh, and it's interesting. Why kill an intellectual? And you kill the intellectual because the power of ideas. Thank you. <clears throat>